Welcome to my talk at MSNT 2020, Industrial Refractory Ceramics, Challenges, Innovations, and Visioneering. Thank you to the organizers of this event, Drs. Tetsuki Oji, John Benner, Martha McCartney, and Anne Louise Lerich for the invitation to speak with you today. This symposia is personally important to me as it reflects the bridge building efforts between the American Ceramic Society and the European Ceramic Society over the recent years. My name is Dana Goski, and I'd like to share with you some thoughts on the future of the refractories industry. The performance of refractory ceramics plays a critical role in the economic success of many high temperature processes, processing industries. These engineered materials are classically dismissed as traditional technologies, yet can be key to the economic successes of numerous high temperature operational challenges. Rapidly connecting new materials developments and processing techniques into scalable commercial manufacturable solutions are crucial. I work in the research and development area of producing commercial engineered ceramic materials, primarily involving monolithic refractories. Monolithic refractory products are used in refractory applications within aerospace, steel, power generation, aluminum, and other light metals, oil and gas, medical grade, alloys, uh, chemical and industrial processing industries that have a significant impact on the global infrastructure and essential goods. The high temperature stability, corrosion resistance, and engineered properties enable our products to be applied to a wide range of applications where improvements in energy efficiency, abrasion resistance, chemical resistance, and performance are desired. It is a continual process for our industry to develop refractory solutions, engineering, and manufactured products. So refractories can be utilized to contain heat or transfer heat, or contain high temperature chemical reactions and processes. In a metal containment system, their function is typically to contain liquid metals and alloys during their processing and remain chemically inert and mechanically sound for as long as possible. In a glass tank, it would be to contain heat and not contaminate the glass product. In cement or mineral processing units, the refractory might be there to protect the steel works from heat, from alkali or acid reactions. In the Bosch area of blast furnace, in a stave or a waste to energy process, the purpose of the refractory may be to transfer heat as efficiently as possible out of that area. This final image is related to products that we supply for launch pads for extreme heat bursts and flame impingement for short periods of time. Refractory ceramics need to withstand extreme heat and gaseous environments to enable the production of other materials like iron, copper, cement, and energy. Refractories are essential to all our lives. I'll share with you some examples of different refractory forms they may be made into. The products in use can range from very traditional high-fired refractory brick to bagged monolithic refractory, which is installed dry and centered into its final form at the customer site, or bagged product, which is mixed with water or liquid carriers and installed at customer sites, to modern, complex, and highly designed finished fired components, such as these. Next, I'd like to share with you some of the challenges to move our industry forward. These processes that utilize refractory can be highly energy intensive. Every bit of efficiency matters. How do we pull heat away more efficiently in a process that is collecting heat or cooling a process that needs to be kept below a certain temperature? How can we sustain heat inside a process better? Can we design to make it easier for the customer staff to use the product, for them to install a product and to reduce their downtime. If we are making precast, pre-fired shapes, how can we dry and fire them quicker and more efficiently ourselves? When we see some fantastic new material discoveries in either heat movement or insulation, mechanical or chemical improvements, how long until these materials or processes are commercially available? 
can these material concepts be partially applied? Or the other extreme, will the vendor still be in business five years from now? Can we adapt some of our process to help form these materials? Tailored properties are a challenge because you want to have the data that represents the system and the operational parameters you're dealing with. And these are typically not accessible. For example, we can use fiber reinforced or large grained aggregate systems for fracture toughness improvement to mitigate crack propagation in refractory products. We can use ranges of bonding systems to optimize hot strength. We can modify ingredients for optical chemical resistance. We want to move to greener product lines, in particular with lower polyaromatic hydrocarbons, lower leachable products, and reduced crystalline silica. How much are our customers willing to pay for a reduced carbon footprint and more recyclable options? What are the guiding principles that varies regionally throughout the globe? Lower cost and higher performance, which is every customer's pipe dream, and new testing methods and applicable data. In our labs, we've had to build some of our own testing equipment because it is not commercially available. And we use technology from totally different industries that aren't covered by any of the classic refractory testing standards. These are some of our materials challenges in refractories. Eileen Daguerre, Director of Communications at the American Ceramic Society, shared this slide with me. It is a high level summary of what is needed for data-driven material discovery, developed through a workshop sponsored by the National Institute of Standards and Technologies Advanced Manufacturing Technologies Program. Key takeaways from the 23 co-authors were published in the Journal of the American Ceramic Society. The article examines the issues, roadblocks, and opportunities in our materials community, such as data harvesting, data storage, and data usage which are required to get to such a destination as this orange box, tailored properties, new compositions, and improved process control. But what does this article mean to developments in refractory materials? What does this mean to manufacturers? It means that if we do not support such efforts and workforce development to integrate these skills for these efforts, our opportunity to provide better solutions is less efficient. My perspective is that the refractories industry leans on stepwise material developments and extending knowledge from parallel materials technologies. Refractories are just at the very beginning of a data-driven materials journey. Before I leave this slide, I'd like to mention that the American Ceramic Society has a technical inter interest group focused on computational design and that I urge our industry to become more involved, if only to learn the landscape of future data-driven discovery. Current industry 4.0 terminology refers to the application of cyber physical systems and how we can improve efficiency, performance, quality, and sustainability. I'd also consider modern product developments as part of industry 4.0. How far down the path are refractories with industry 4.0? Industry 4.0 means digitizing parts of the materials business value chain. It means smarter factories. It means smarter solutions at the customer implementation level. In 2009, RHI Magnesita, one of the world's largest vertically integrated refractory producers, published that their integrated facilities have 500 main machines exchanging information, creating 75,000 tags per second. They highlighted an automated impulse echo ultrasound system for one of their high value brick production lines for quality control. It isn't just refractory producers, though, who need to work with Industry 4.0. It's, it is suppliers and end customers, which means some needed tools still must be developed. Some of the manufacturing challenges that we experience in the refractories industry are supply chain management, digitization, and sustainability, optimized refractory blending, and packaging automation. 
data analytics throughout the production and quality evaluation process, improve process control. Predictive maintenance, being able to tell when our equipment is getting ready to go down, being able to tell ahead of that time so we can prevent that downtime. The use of virtual reality programs for training and optimization. Um, an example could be a virtual reality program that builds a furnace and shows a customer how the furnace would go together. It might be a training program inside the manufacturing operation. Google Glass is a tool that's been used at some companies for inspections and record keeping to keep safe and hands-free. Simulations of modeling, simulations and modeling of process. This is near and dear to my heart. I would love to see more work in this area. Data science tools for new potential commercial materials or composites to pass more heat effectively or to keep heat stored more efficiently or to convert heat to something else. One of the other manufacturing challenges, challenges is bleeding and leading edge technology transfer to the industry may be inhibited and likely is inhibited by scale up and costs, which are then passed on to the customer. And my final note with manufacturing challenges is workforce development, and I will touch on that uh, at the end of my presentation. Moving on to innovations and rapid connections. I'm gonna share with you a few innovative solutions applied in our research laboratories. Some of these were created out of customer need, some strictly on improved longevity or to reduce waste and improve sustainability. I've selected two examples our group has worked on to share with you. Let me expand on the title. The term monolithic is implying one large mass when installed. The system is graphitic in nature and think of a castable refractory in parallel to a high temperature concrete, but with many material differences. The goal of this monolithic graphitic castable refractory was to develop a new material to allow for rapid repair of very long, of carbon, worn carbon brick, which typically have a very long lead time to produce if one were to replace them. A blast furnace is several stories tall with different refractory product in different zones. So our brief was to develop a graphitic monolithic suitable for blast furnace lining applications, validate the concept with instrumentation, and optimize the thermal conductivity. The product had additional criteria that it had to be water friendly and pumpable over long distances and up several stories vertically. Pumping and shockcreting are terms used to move material in large volumes. So we're installing truckloads of refractory in a couple hours. Additional goals included adhesion to the existing carbon brick, matching the thermal conductivity, thermal shock resistance, strength, abrasion resistance, alkali resistance, and processing dryability to remove the water. So this video demonstrates adherence and hardening of the castable, which was applied to a test panel in the lab via shock reading. We may can use this material to line the Bosch area of blast furnaces in several countries now. This has been installed both by manual shock creating and robotically. While the monolithic graphitic castable is not identical to carbon brick, it offers a way to repair a carbon brick lining quickly in high volume and with reasonable properties. If we look over to the image, we can see on the right, this is the shock crete nozzle to apply the material and accelerant comes through this and mixes with the refractory as it's applied to the wall. This is a wall of carbon brick. An interesting result from this work was that our R prime, our thermal shock factor, was actually better with this product than the original carbon brick. Here is an example of one of our early small scale field test installations. The carbon brick 
are already in the in the working lining and they're numbered with chalk on the left. And let's hit play. Or maybe we won't hit play. So the video is not working. Let's try a different arrow. Okay, so we will we'll skip over that video. But the video, what it's showing is that the um, material is being applied over the brick and the brick is set up in a, a checkered pattern. And there we go. So the second innovative approach I'd like to share are some solutions wherein we have developed ceramic matrix composites for some applications where fast changes in temperature occur. In these examples, we're striving to keep the working lining hot face in compression. This is an induction furnace for conversion of carbon to graphite. The carbon wear is packed in refractory rings inside the induction furnace. So the image on your left is probably 15 feet tall maybe taller. The induction field converts the carbon to graphite. During various stages of the process, these rings can experience unbelievable thermal stress differentials from hot face to the outer cool face. In this example, we are inserting a fiber winding preform into a casting of refractory so that the winding is a component within the refractory wall itself. This system has been highly successful in the field. This is a balance of a number of input criteria and parameters, including but not limited to the type of fiber to wind, hoop stress at operational temperatures, the type of wind, and the refractory castable in use considerations. We have applied a similar approach to induction furnace refractory crucibles. These precast, pre-fired composite crucibles are used in furnaces where the refractory cracks heavily due to thermal differences. The thermal difference can be from the top to the bottom of a crucible due to low metal uh, liquid levels, or it can be due to slow pouring operations where the exposed backside of the crucible cools more quickly than the side that's underneath the metal. The composite crucible can also be applied to minimize mechanical impact damage. These are not inexpensive solutions, but they have found homes ranging from aluminum to steel powder metallurgical operations. They can provide several times the lining life when optimized. I'd also like to give a shout out to our co-inventor on the patent and the original winder, uh, Duncan Laurie of Laurie Technology in PA who's an expert in many things related to fiber winding. So let's talk about the future and where we might be headed. Understanding the situation inside a processing vessel and inside the working refractory lining would help in understanding current failure mechanisms. For this to be possible, we need rugged sensors for harsh environments in order to monitor the health of the refractory lining. Maybe most importantly, such rugged sensors will, sensors will potentially allow for predictive failure monitoring. Bridging sensor technologies from other industries may actually be the simplest approach. The refractory failing isn't necessarily a problem. Not being able to predict the failure is. I've worked with some open innovation companies to try to identify potential candidate sensors. Many fell into the bleeding edge or leading edge category. This also means cost is an issue. And in refractory applications, you typically do not expect to reuse a sensor if it's embedded in the lining. I'm looking forward to better sensors and monitoring tools in the future for harsh applications, and the industry would welcome new ideas. 
I'm also looking forward to better and representative data for simulation and modeling abilities. These have been growing, have been a growing interest area for refractories for the last decade. The upcoming major international refractories meeting UNITESER has dedicated two sessions to data and simul simulation. I would be remiss if I did not mention Athor Network in Europe. Athor is an innovation research project dedicated to advanced thermomechanical multi-scale modeling of refractory linings. This European training program started in 2017 as a Marie Sklodowska Curie action. The Athor network reports that it is dedicated to training researchers in multi-engineering required fields for a better understanding of thermomechanical behavior of refractory linings used in iron and steel applications. This is certainly an exciting network trying to make inroads with these challenges. Let's touch on sustainability further. The use of recycled materials into refractories is limited by the quality assurance of the recycled components. In fact, one of the most common components utilized in low cement monolithic refractory castables is a byproduct. It is fume silica or silica fume. This micron sized material is collected off various types of high volume silicon processing. Castable manufacturers use it to help optimize particle packing for the benefit of reduced water content with improved product flow, leading to better products. The consistency of the feedstock can be quite variable. Leachable alkalis, density differences, carbon content, phosphate content. Vendor capabilities to control the quality of the byproduct do exist some with air classification for optimization, but controls vary widely from company to company. Other recycled materials include crushed refractory brick and cleaned and crushed used, used cast alumina zirconia silicate blocks coming out of glass tanks. High alumina spark plug bodies have been a popular clean alumina source for the industry. I also swear I have seen some pieces of porcelain sanitary wear in some low temperature refractories as well at some point in competitive analysis. The key is consistency for the application intended. Environmental stewardship. Environmental stewardship is everyone's business. Our main Chinese facility is ISO 14000 certified. That standard indicates environmental responsibility and actually it is our first facility to be of that particular ISO category. And that's exciting. It's exciting to see people moving us forward and taking care of our environmental responsibilities. New centering techniques. New centering techniques requiring less energy and a lower carbon footprint would also contribute to a vision of better sustainability. Lizbeth Horkman's and co-authors report on um, worldwide refractory production and waste management. And they estimated that um, the refractory, worldwide refractory production may be about 40 million tons per year. By the numbers, the largest user is iron and steel uh, at about 70% during a peak demand year. That would not be a COVID year. <laughs> the publication informed reported in 2016 that about 46% of refractories worldwide used are clay-based and about 26 are magnesium-based. Opportunity for businesses with new support technologies such as laser-induced breakdown spectroscopy can promote recycling. It is currently estimated that about 7% of refractories are recycled. Now, please note that refractory producers can reuse other ceramic materials in their processes as a regular feedstock vendor if their quality is controlled as highlighted in the first bullet point. So this is where one works with the ceramics community to reuse materials where possible. Referring to the Horkman report further, um, Refractory recycling innovation can be mapped through patent applications. So this table is that I'm sharing from recycling of refractory bricks used in basic steel making um, is indicative of the amount of interest 
in recycling of refractory materials. Working to one of my favorite topics, workforce development. It is absolutely critical for vision and sustainability within our industry. Short-term materials programs, particularly geared to technician training and quality skills knowledge are needed. This has led to some collaborative efforts with both the Edward Orton Jr. Ceramic Foundation and the American Ceramic Society to build a two-year accredited ceramic technician program in Ohio, which is still in development. In 2014, the National Research Council published STEM integration K through 12 education, status, prospects, and agenda for research, where they recommended giving students awareness of material science engineering before college with improved STEM integration in early education. I've worked at my local school district level to support their efforts to move in this direction. We must also support diversity and inclusion. While it's not only the right thing to do, business analyst McKinsey, Harvard Business Review, and Forbes report that industry and businesses that are more diverse and inclusive are statistically more innovative and successful. As mentioned previously, integration with data science is important, as well as better tools to help with materials characterization for the end users. People are not machines, but machines can help leverage what they can discover. I'd like to close with this. If anyone in the audience has information they'd like to share and additional perspectives to the refractory ceramics industry, please feel free to contact me. The future of ceramic and glass materials is very bright. Therefore, so is the future of refractory ceramics. Thank you to my colleagues for sharing images and reviewing parts of this presentation. And thank you for your attention.